It's been over a week since Matt Chandler stepped down. Um, they've decided, and again, I think they're right, um, to put me on a leave of absence, um, uh, starting uh, immediately from preaching and teaching at um, the Village Church. And as soon as that news broke, everyone was theorizing what happened, what is the truth of what happened in this circumstance. Did Matt Chandler disqualify himself? There have been takes all of all different kinds from folks saying that what happened here with the village church was a great example of church discipline like this this was a good and healthy exercise of church discipline and that this was handled in a way that is godly and then of course there's the other side of people saying that hey we should have known this was coming after all matt's woke right anytime a man starts preaching woke ideology, starts going outside the bounds of theological orthodoxy, starts going outside the bounds of Bible doctrine, starts preaching things that are just blatantly not true, there's something in their life. With so many versions of this story being told, we got to ask which one is true, or at least based on what we know, which one is most likely. After all, Jesus wants the rose! So let's talk about the three, I think, main ideas of what happened. Now, I want to be clear before we get too far into this thing. We're not trying to gossip. We're not trying to look at things that aren't there. But based on the information, you probably know the information. It's been a week, all right? I, I made a, an initial video just, just basically to have like some conversation with you guys about what you guys all thought about this Matt Chandler situation. And then I kind of just sat back and just watched people kind of react. And, and a lot of, you know, people went out on a limb, either defending him or accusing him. And so I want to kind of just sit and evaluate a few of those different takes. Because in my opinion, I think that it all boils down to three different uh, scenarios. The first one is that everything that the village church did was right. That what was said was the complete truth, the whole of the matter. Now, uh, a lot of people are, you know, they're good people who, who believe that and they, they heard everything and they maybe some people who are really attached to Matt Chandler. That's, you know, we all have our heroes and like you saw, like Jesus wants the rose. That's one of the most impactful statements in evangelicalism in the last like 50 years. So it's, it, he's an important figure for a lot of people. So I understand like why some people would be so uh, immediately defending him. And you might be like, well, you know, maybe I wasn't. I'm just saying like, from my point of view, the, the, the facts of what were presented, there does seem like there was some missing information at the very least. Now, of course that's going to happen because we're not at that church, or at least I'm not at that church. Maybe you are watching this. Maybe this is your church. It's your pastor that we're talking about. That's a different scenario. But for most people who are watching this, most people who are thinking through, most people who listen to Matt Chandler, maybe even on a weekly basis, who digest his books, all of that kind of stuff, uh, most of us aren't there. So that that's important to say, because we're not in the in the know about everything and most of the time when a church has some kind of horrific thing going on whether it's some sin from the pulpit whether there's other stuff going on where the authorities need to be uh, involved usually when that's presented to the public and to the world like let's let's not kid ourselves when they go onto that stage even at their own church and they stream out their service the world is watching. It's not just people who are at home or sick or something like that. So the world was watching and they had an announcement for the world. That's why I think that a lot of the, the things that were said uh, were, you know, PR versions of what happened. That's, that's what I think. Now, uh, the reason why some people are saying that this is the, the right approach to this story is because of something that uh, Preston Sprinkle, who is uh, a pastor, YouTuber, podcaster, uh, he he said, I'm not too familiar with him, but a lot of you guys are, uh, and some of you guys told me about this. So he, he posted this on Instagram, I guess, right before he went 
on um, sabbatical. He said, uh, hey friends, I just wanted everyone to know that I've looked extensively into all the stuff involving Matt Chandler on the Village Church. I've talked to Matt twice, so he's a friend. That's a big difference between me and probably you. Um, So he's talked to Matt twice and talked to a woman who's been on staff at the church for over 18 years. I can't share private details, but I will say that so much of the way the popular media, including uh, or secular and even Christian, so that would be, I mean, in some way, people here on YouTube, is portraying it is pretty bad, and that even the church's messaging framed it in some pretty negative terms that could be misconstrued, which is what I'm talking about, like the PR language, like the the language that they chose to use. Uh, a lot of that was, you know, what which word do they not want to use, you know? <laughs> so I think he's talking about that kind of framing. Pretty negative terms that could be misconstrued. The coarse joking uh, was jokes about alcohol, not sexual innuendos or lewd jokes. And the big issue was that his DM relationship seemed too familiar for someone that he didn't know terribly well in person. He basically violated the Billy Graham rule. And then he goes on to be clear. The woman he was messaging wasn't at all offended and told Matt, don't you dare apologize. You did nothing wrong. It was the woman's friend who lives by a very strict Billy Graham type of rule that was offended that Matt was DMing a married woman, even though Matt's wife and the woman's husband was fully aware of it. An independent organization scoured his electronics and found no P-O-R-N, and no other inappropriate or romantic sort of messaging. All this to say, I have no problem still having Matt speak at the Exiles Conference this year. I mean, if we applied the same standard to all speakers, I'm not sure I'd be able to have any speakers at the conference. Honestly, this whole thing has made me want to reintegrate the Billy Graham rule into my own life. People give me a hard time because I do uh, I do try to be extra vigilant in keeping my relationships with other women much more cautious, but I've been thinking maybe I should be more friendly and jovial, but it's situations like Matt's that make me more nervous about this, but I've got to run, hope, uh, hopping on a plane to a uh, sabbatical, Preston. So I feel like that is a huge part of this, uh, that you have a friend coming to Matt's defense and saying, hey, the language that was used, while it is accurate, could be taken in a negative way. Uh, I think that's, that's some proof to this take, this take that the village church did everything right, that what they're saying is the real story of what happened. And the vague language would just be a mistake. That would be that would be one take. I'll give my conclusion in the end here. But take number two is a little bit different. <laughs> take number two is, yes, everything happened correctly, or at least what was said was true uh, from that stage. But Matt has disqualified himself. Now, uh, if we're going to take that kind of interpretation of what was said and say, okay, that is the whole of the matter, then we do have what Preston Sprinkle is calling uh, a violation of the Billy Graham rule. Now, my question for anyone who would hold this view, like Spencer Smith, and actually I've had a lot of people in, in, my, in my chat, in my comments uh, of that video talk about how, of course, we should have seen this coming because of his liberal theology. And that, that opinion is really, if you have bad theology, it will impact your life to where you will live sinfully. This always happens. That's usually the phrasing that is used always like that's an absolute now uh to those people i would say well first like let's go with the bible all right if we're talking about qualifications and if it is some kind of violation uh, of uh the billy graham rule is that in the qualifications is that what it means to be above reproach in that you can't dm women uh you can't have any kind of friendly online relationship with a woman that's really debatable. And then I would also say, look at his theology in the past. Now, if you don't like Matt Chandler, you don't like Matt Chandler. I'm not going to change your mind, right? But I would say that his theology has been very consistent. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of him. 
but a lot of people are, and, and they, they've uh, been listening to him, his sermons, his books, reading all of that stuff. And I would say that even what I have uh, observed from him, I don't believe that he's changed his theology. I don't see a difference from, you know, Jesus wants the rose to what we saw uh, up to two weeks ago. Uh, I don't see that big of a difference. Now, there have been different things that have been talked about, uh, you know, specifically to the cultural moment, things that are going on. But theologically, I haven't seen any change in Matt Chandler. Yes, he is still reformed in his soteriology. Yes, he is still charismatic in how he views the giftings. All of those things are still there. He hasn't changed a whole lot. Now, for those people who are saying, well, it's the woke stuff, watch other things here on my channel. We're not going to agree about that. And I don't think it's necessarily the case for two different reasons. First, we have so many different examples of people who have gone liberal in their theology and still being consistent, at least to living out the ethics of the kingdom, which is what I would call living a good and moral, holy life. All right, following what Jesus said and how we should interact with one another in worshiping God in our daily life. Um, so we have tons of examples like that throughout Christian history, liberals, theologically, who actually live out the gospel in their daily life. And then also we have people like, let's be real. We've got tons of people who say the right things in pulpits and then go out and live terrible lives. Like we, we've, we've talked about that a whole bunch on my channel, especially lately. We have story after story of people uh, who hold conservative theology, who are not woke, who don't buy into CRT, who don't do any of those kinds of things, and then they live out terrible lives. And even if you were to look at uh, you know the grand scope of evangelicalism and some of the stories that have come out lately, uh, there's a lot of stories that are from the conservative side. So I don't believe that that is always the case. Now, uh, I think that there is a likelihood that happens if you are uh, giving into like really bad theology, you start giving up core tenets of the faith, then probably you're on your way out the door. And when you go out the door, the morality usually stays behind too. So that is accurate. But if we're talking about pastors and those who are continuing in ministry, who still believe the gospel, who preach the gospel, I don't believe that's necessarily the case all the time. So we need to be very careful because really what we're saying is you better agree with me. And if you don't, then probably you're hiding something and it becomes very accusatory. It becomes like seeking out what is that thing? Well, if that guy gives into that theological position, you know, he's probably cheating on his wife, stuff like that. It's ridiculous. We need to be able to have conversations with one another. And that, that take on this story, I think is probably the worst take that you could probably have. Now, the third take I would say is that there's, there's just a little bit more to this story. And for some people, they take that and they go really far with that take. For me, like I said, I, I basically hold to the first one, at least up to this moment. I'm not going to be naive and say that this is 100% absolutely the, the right take and everything that this church has ever done is right and holy because we don't know. I don't know. I don't go there. I'm not a part of the leadership there. I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that everything everyone has ever done is good and holy. Not going to do that. Uh, but from what has been said, I have to go with what, what we know. I'm not going to speculate super far into it. I'm going to look at what was said and done, but I'm not going to read into things that aren't there. Uh, so I think that's important. Now, some people are doing that. Some people are going way too far with this and they're saying, okay, well, there's more to this story. There's inconsistencies in the story, which I would say is actually I think accurate. Now, what Sprinkle was saying that is that it was just the church not wording things properly and making it look worse than it was. Maybe that's accurate. Um, but I think it's at least clear that there's some things in that story that don't that don't really line up too much, especially when you get into the altercation and the timeline being in February and we're just hearing about this now. And what how long does it take to do an investigation on one person? You know, this isn't the SBC and everything with, you know, hundreds of people being interviewed. We're talking about one specific person. Uh, so I, I like there are things there. 
But what, what some people are doing is they're seeing those holes and they're like fitting this narrative into it and saying that, well, that means that, you know, he's a predator, that he is an abuser and that he is, you know, all these different stories that we've seen. And one, one thing I want to say is that I do sympathize with that because I mean, all of us have seen these stories and I, at some point we got to stop, you know, expecting it to be something else. Um, you know, everyone is innocent until proven guilty, but also, you know, we, we understand how the world works and how some of these stories have transpired. So there's a little bit of me that's sympathetic to that position, but also we need just to be careful that we're not just accusing brothers and sisters of the worst kinds of sin when something gets said. Sometimes, you know, people are honest. <laughs> sometimes, you know, maybe they didn't word everything correctly, but sometimes people are honest and they say, hey, this happened. Uh, and, and we need to be careful to accept that and not go further and say, well, we know that just because you're saying this, there must be something deeper and it's worse than, you know, we could possibly imagine. That's where things go wrong. Now, uh, so my conclusion on that is a mixture. I would say a mixture of the take one of that things were done correctly and take two of there's something that's being, you know, not told or at least said differently. Uh, because like I said, there are some inconsistencies in the story. So what, what do we do with that? Well, I think the thing that we need to do is first off hope that, you know, we don't have to hear about this again. <laughs> you know, I wanted to kind of sit back and just see what people were saying about this. Um, but I, I was not hoping for there to be more information because I did want it to be that first take that everything was done right. And we could just like leave it alone. And that church is going to deal with it and they're going to deal with things in a right way. Um, uh, but also, uh, I, I do want to kind of just point out something and something that uh, Amy Bird wrote. And I know that, you know, Amy Bird is a name that, you know, some people will automatically be like, I'm writing off everything that's being said now. Uh, but some people also love her. So uh, I, I find her helpful sometimes. Uh, not I just don't read her all that often. But uh, she said this, and think of how this framing, so she's talking about this story, if it is accurate, if the church said everything that happened here, uh, what are the implications for brothers and sisters relating to one another? Basically, that Billy Graham rule that everyone has been talking about and I talked about right off the bat. Uh, and think of how this framing of the relationship will affect women in the church. If yet again, send... Uh, it, it yet again sends the message that men, especially pastors, cannot have healthy siblingship relationships with women. Be careful not to talk frequently with us. Be careful not to be too familiar with us. Be careful not to joke around us. You will not be above reproach. Look what happened to our beloved Chandler. Now, some of you might read that or hear that, and you're just like, well, you know, we're, men and women are different, and uh, so we need to just kind of stay away from each other. Uh, but I believe in the church that we should be able to have these brother and sister relationships where not everything is viewed as uh, an attempt at some kind of, you know, for for uh, Matt Chandler, an affair, uh, some kind of, um, you know, devious kind of motives attached to things. We should be able to have relationships to where we're talking with people and it should be normal. It should be normative for brothers and sisters to be able to have DMs. I believe that. Now, I also know, once again, I'm not going to be naive enough to say that uh, there isn't, you know, at least some difference between men and women to where men are going to be thinking about these kinds of things more often. But I think that we should be relying on the Holy Spirit to where we can actually, you know, have these relationships while still having some guardrails in our life to where it doesn't go too far because it can. Emotional affairs happen. We need to be careful about that. But I do think that we need to learn how to interact with one another in a way to where we can actually have some of these genuine friendships between men and women that we actually see in the Bible. Like we, we see friendships between men and women in the Bible. Why can't we have that? If, if what was the, uh, the take number one, that everything was said and done correctly, that it was just a breaking of the Billy Graham rule, I do think that there's somewhat of a dangerous precedent in that. 
uh, to where we're going to judge people for having good relationships uh, with, um, you know, people of the opposite gender. And you can argue, you know, should pastors be doing that? I think they, they should. And usually the people who are asking that are also the people who say that pastors shouldn't have good friendships in the church because you can't say too much about your own life. You can't say that you've fallen and made mistakes, because if you do, you're not above reproach anymore. People aren't going to respect you. And so we keep people at arm's length for pastors. And I think that's a dangerous thing as well. So what happened here? We don't know. And we need to be very careful about not speculating too far. But I do think that there are some things that uh, were worded here, probably, probably just in a wrong way. Just to be just to be honest with you guys, I think that it could have been worded a lot better to where we could actually have had um, some insight into what what is course joking because that sounds awful. You know, honestly, if I was Matt Chandler and if all of that is true that it was just this DM relationship that was frequent and familiar and it was what Sprinkle said about some of these jokes, uh, I would be pretty upset uh, about how the church portrayed it. Uh, because we're all like the world is talking about it and it didn't have to be that way. Um, you know, there's something to the, if the idea of accountability and cutting something off before it starts, but to present it that way on the stage to the world, uh, in such vague statements, if it is what this was, I gotta say, I would be pretty ticked <laughs> if that was me, but that's just me. I'd be interested to know what you take. You could come and you can let me know. You can let me know here in uh, the chat. You can let me know uh, in the comment section and you can let me know in the next stream. We're going to do an after live, see what you guys think about this. And, uh, you know, you come on over. It should redirect. If it doesn't, though, uh, just go back onto my page. I'll be live in about like 30 seconds over there. So I'll see you there.